Golden Visas, Digital Nomad Visas, Citizenship by Ancestry, Economic Citizenship. I'm sure you've heard all these terms and more and you're thinking, what do they mean and are any of use to me? Well, a second passport can open up many doors, the freedom to travel, the freedom to live in two countries, to work or buy property in two countries. But how do you go about getting one and how do you know the country you should apply to for one? Recently, Henley & Partners, a big wealth consultancy firm, just released its annual World's Best Passport list. And on this episode, IL's Chief Global Diversification Expert, Ted Bauman, gives us his take on these kind of lists and why he doesn't like them. For example, Japan is the number one passport on the Henley list, but how likely is it that you're going to get a Japanese passport? It's extremely hard to do. Japan is great, but, you know, just because a country is high up on a list, does it make a good option for you? Maybe not. On this episode, Ted talks about some really good practical advice and steps he would go about taking to gain a second passport. There's lots of different styles of decision making. For example, first up, he would think about the country. Seems practical, right? Do you like the weather, the people, the culture, the food? Do you hear Ted's second, third and fourth steps? Tune into the rest of the episode. You can also find out more on Ted's writings and musings by signing up for the International Living Postcards, the daily postcards, I will send a send, uh, link below, and you can check out our website, www.internationalliving.com. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Ted, good morning. Thank you for joining us here on ILTV. How are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. Um, as you can see, I'm uh, my office is looking a bit bare. That's because I'm packing up uh, to make an international move. Uh, I'm leaving for Cape Town in two weeks, so it's been busy the last couple of days. Very exciting. There's nothing more stressful than a move. I did it around the corner to where my house was. I can't even imagine going international. Well, it's I, it's not my first time. so <laughs> Not your first rodeo. <laughs> no. <laughs> so just to give the viewers a bit of context, um, Ted is International Living's new Chief Global Diversification Officer. I love that title. Um, so Ted, maybe before we get talking about Second Passports, can you just give the viewers a little bit of a background? Sure. Uh, I was uh, born in the United States um, and uh, grew up uh, on the East Coast. And uh, just after high school, I spent a year at university and then just kind of got the travel itch. And I ended up um, in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, one way or another, I spent the next 25 years there practically without un uh, un interruption, you know. I uh, ended up becoming a permanent resident and then a citizen, got married, bought a house, but became very South Africanized. <laughs> Probably hear a bit of an accent there. You can hear the accent, uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how long it was. So, um, but in that process, while I was working down there, um, I became a, a, a high-ranking executive, if you like, at some nonprofit organizations that were involved in international issues. And so I ended up traveling a lot and, and I... I at one point or another in my life, I've set foot in more than 85 countries, I think, last time I, I counted. Um, and then after that, I spent some time, I was recruited to come work here in Atlanta, where I am at the moment, by a big nonprofit here that also specializes in housing. And then they sent me to a bunch of countries. And so I just, I've been everywhere. I mean, you name it, I've probably been there. Um, and so that's given me a lot of insight into the international world and, of course, um, because of my long association with South Africa, I have a lot of European friends here because there's a lot of back and forth. And so I've got a lot of insight into that continent in particular. And uh, just, you know, I, I'm an international person. I'm diversified, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so we're going to jump into it. So this is all about second passports. Um, Ted has a lot of good, deep knowledge on this topic. So Henley and Partners, who are a big international wealth consultancy, they just released their world's best passport list. So what do you think of those kind of lists? Uh, you know, I don't like them. I mean, they, they get a lot of press attention. And, you know, it's a headline. It's clickbait, right? The world's best passport. Um, you know, I, I respect what Henley does. Uh, but I think ultimately, if you look at their list, the fact that Japan is the number one passport uh, should tell you something. I mean, Japan requires you to give up any other citizenship, right? Uh, it requires you to speak fluent Japanese. It's a 10-year uh, process to get a passport. 
So to call that the best passport in the world means that they have a very narrow view of what constitutes a good passport. And in Henley's case, what they do is they say, how many countries will let you into their country without a visa on a Japanese passport or on any passport? And Japan happens to be number one. Now, I love Japan, love Japanese culture, love the food. My daughter's a big fan of manga and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the country I would choose, you know, um, and I doubt most Americans would either. So I think the problem is that, you know, these lists are really based on very limited criteria that don't really tell you what you need to know to make informed decisions for yourself if you want to get a second citizenship. So, you know, it, it's a good starting point. It is an important issue, the freedom to travel. But almost any country, I think that our potential, our viewers here would potentially consider would be relatively high on Henley's list, uh, but probably better suited than Japan. Yeah, so it sounds like they're not thinking of it even as a, you know, of how likely it is that you're able to get it, because that sounds yeah. almost impossible to get that Japanese one. But also from a lifestyle point of view, you know, they're probably yeah. not thinking of that either. Yeah. So that's a good point. And so let's say you, Ted, were considering a second citizenship. How would you go about it? What are the things you'd be thinking about? Well, the first thing I would do is consider whether the country is a place I'd want to live. Um, you know, going back to Japan, I mean, like, I mean, I just admire the country and the people, but I just don't feel like that would really make me happy as a person. Um, and, and ultimately, the whole point of having a second passport is to have a place to go and stay and be if you want or if need be. And I think ultimately you have to know yourself well enough to know uh, what kind of environment you'd like to live in. So the first thing I would do is, is consider the country itself, you know, the, the, the place, the people, the culture, the cuisine, the, the, the attitudes, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that would be my first thing. Um, now, other people, we'll talk about this in a minute, but other people have different approaches, but that's mine. The second one I would say is I would look at the government and taxation, health care, public services and things like that. Um, I don't mind if they're not the best in the world, but um, they should not be more of a burden than the place I'm coming from, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, so, you know, the United States, uh, you know, has a, a, a lot of push factors. There are a lot of reasons why people are looking to go abroad from the U.S., but you don't want to go someplace that's worse in, in those kinds of environments. So that would be my second set of criteria. And then I would look at secondary benefits like travel rights to other countries. You know, uh, for example, uh, everybody likes the EU because the EU, uh, an EU passport gets you into the whole continent. And um, and that's just, you know, kind of the, the holy grail uh, if, if you can do it. Uh, so so that would be my thing. But I, I just can't emphasize enough that for normal people who really are looking for a, a life uh, as opposed to just a piece of paper, for technical reasons, um, you've got to consider the country and, and the lifestyle, I think, number one. And so let me get this straight. So is that is that just the case that maybe lists themselves aren't very useful to people because it's such a personalized experience yeah. and personalized? So like a list is a hard thing for people to wrap their head around when it's just, I guess, it's just a generalizing of, of the places. Is that what you're saying? Right. So it's more personalized. Oh, culture. very much so. And, and I think also that... You know, if you look at these lists, um, you, you mentioned it earlier, but the practicalities of actually getting a passport. I mean, the fact that a country is high up on the list doesn't mean that it's a, a, a real option for, for you um, or for any of us. And I think that's the, you know, the problem with the list approach is that it doesn't really go into that. So, so what I try to do is to, you know, when people come to me and say, well, I'm interested in going abroad, I'm interested in a second passport, um, there's a lot more to it. And we have to have a conversation about you know, what the person uh, wants, uh, what their requirements are, uh, what their tolerances are, I think is important. I mean, what, what are you willing to put up with? Because um, you know, every country has got its quirks uh, and uh, you have to know yourself, I think, before you make the leap. And that's really the critical thing. And lists don't do that for you. No, and, then, and what we're talking about here as well, just so I'm fully understanding it, is when you actually go and spend time in these countries and as a result, then you can gain some citizenship, right? In a lot of cases. Well, that's one route. I mean, I, I mean, I think that there, there are a number of different routes to uh, second citizenships. Um, 
And, uh, you know, if, if, if you take my approach, then I think the lifestyle thing would be number one. In fact, that's the reason why I ended up in South Africa. I just basically fell in love with the place. Um, and that meant that I was, um, in a sense, this, the decision was made for me. Um, once I'd committed to the place, then, you know, the, the, the process went on until I became a citizen. But I think most people would, would most likely do that anyway. I think yeah. we'll, we'll talk about the different approaches to, to, to choosing second passports. But the most sensible one is, is to treat it as an extension of yourself and your lifestyle. I mean, that's, I think, the key thing. Yeah, yeah. Especially, I guess, for international living readers, that's the one that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And so, okay, so maybe talk about some of those different styles of decision making when it comes to um, looking for a second citizenship. Right. Well, you know, the vast majority of people who have acquired second citizenship uh, around the world uh, are from countries where, um, for whatever reason, they really feel like they want to have an option. Uh, and numerically, I think the Chinese dominate the second passport industry by quite a long shot. Uh, if you look at any given country, I mean, we've we've been talking about golden visas here at IL for a while. All of those programs are overwhelmingly dominated by Chinese. And the Chinese look at it very much as a sort of political economic question. You know, it's like, where can I get one? Can I afford it? Um, the lifestyle issues, uh, I'm sure, are important to many individual Chinese, but the most important thing is to have that document so that if necessary, they can leave and take their money, maybe through Bitcoin or something out of China. Um, and so that's a, a very economic kind of coldly rational way. And I don't think most of our viewers would, would do it this way. Um, the second approach is what I call kind of a libertarian approach. And uh, that's based on what they call flag theory. Um, if you do any reading or research about second citizenships or offshore residents, you'll find mentions of flag theory. And flag theory is basically, it's based on the idea, as Andrew Henderson uh, at Nomad Capitalist says, go where you're treated best. So it's a very individualized, me-focused approach. And the idea is that you don't put all of your chips, you know, it, it, you know on the table. You you move your assets around, you have citizenship in one country or maybe two, you have money in another country, you have a home in another country. So the idea is to be diversified so that uh, you're not tied down to any one place. But the motivation behind that kind of flag theory approach is very individualistic and it's not really lifestyle oriented. It's more about trying to avoid responsibility to government, to the rest of society, to the rest of community, um, and personally, I don't think that anybody going to a foreign country should do it for selfish personal reasons. Mm -hmm. I think you go because you want to be part of a, a, another community that you're comfortable in. And then from there, you get the benefits. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the second way. Um, then the third way is my approach, which is that you spend time in a place and you fall in love with it. I mean, you and I have spoken about Cape Town. I, I know yes. you've been there. I totally love get it. the love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it was love at first sight for me. And uh, I think a lot of people will go to countries and just feel like this is my place. Uh, a lot of Americans, for example, go to Mexico and to um, Central America. And, and in some of the places like Costa Rica, for example, there's a pathway to citizenship, Nicaragua, for example. Um, and they just like the place. They feel comfortable mm -hmm. there. And I think that's, that's another route. It's kind of a roundabout one because it may take some time, but the advantage of that is that by the time you decide to become a citizen, you have established real connections to the country and you can prove it to the authorities. So it kind of smooths your pathway. Um, so, you know, that often involves uh, interim residence of some kind that leads to a passport. And then the, the, the least common way, I think, is the best way, which is thinking through it the way you would any major life decision, which is kind of what I'm recommending is that, you know, if you were going to move to another town or to, uh, you know, another uh, job or something like that, you would think through what are the pros and the cons? What do I want to achieve out of this? What's the end result? Right. And I think that's what I really am encouraging people to do. And that's what I'm going to be doing here at IL is helping people to think through, you know, not from a coldly economic, rational, right. you know, it's as you, what, what would make you happy as a person and what's the best fit for you? And that's the one that I, I, I recommend the most. 
I like that. And you mentioned there just about that flag theory. So that's obviously a benefit of getting a second citizenship. But yeah. what other benefits are there to getting a second passport or a second citizenship? Other benefits? Well, I mean, look, a passport is, is really just a document that's attached to second citizenship. And second citizenship means that you become a full member of the political um, uh, community of that country. And, and I emphasize political first because that's what nations are based on. It, it's a, it's a, a group of people who are governed together by, by, by systems and they owe allegiance to, to those systems. Uh, they agree to be subject to their laws and things like that. So, um, you know, when you do that, you, you are gaining whatever rights that second citizenship offers you. Um, I mean, we go back to the EU is the best example. The benefit of an EU passport is that you're an, also an EU citizen, right? And that's just a huge, huge benefit uh, to anybody. Um, and so passports uh, are about citizenship. But I think a lot of people um, kind of forget about that. So what does it mean to be a citizen of a country, like in my case, of, like South Africa? Well, um, you know, I have all the rights and obligations uh, of, of a South African citizen, um, you know, I, I have to file my taxes, I have to abide by the laws of the country, all that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, um, South Africa is, is not too uh, difficult in that sense. Some countries are. Uh, but the critical thing always to remember is that although the passport is going to give you something, it's also going to take something from you. Right. In the sense that you've now got two countries to which you owe allegiance, uh, uh, at least formally, even if you don't feel that way you know, personally, um, and that you have to take that into account. And, and once you accept that, then you begin to understand uh, how to make the right decisions uh, to get a second passport. Right. And actually, even just thinking, my sister lives in Australia and they're currently applying for their permanent residency. But when uh, COVID hit and lockdown hit, they still obviously are their Irish citizens. And so they were in Perth and Perth completely locked down and they couldn't leave. Mm -hmm. But had they have had their permanent residency, they could have freely traveled between Ireland and um, and uh, Australia. It would have given it would open it up, I suppose, uh, travel for them, which they Oh, could. absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think yeah. there are many countries where, um, I mean, that's kind of an, an, an unusual situation. Yeah, COVID, totally. But... I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> But, but there are many countries, I think, where, um, you know, the having that second passport means that, that, you know, you get access to something that is denied to others. I mean, yeah. just to, to take it, some countries have uh, property ownership limitations for foreigners, for example. Uh, some countries uh, force you to, to buy property through a trust or something uh, rather than uh, through individual ownership. Um, and, but once you become a citizen, then you can own your property outright. And that gives you an extra layer of security. Um, when I travel, for example, um, I sometimes choose to use my second or my South African passport because the country that I go to is friendlier right. uh, to, to South Africa than it is to the United States. Now, those countries, you know, Vietnam is a good example. I mean, Vietnam doesn't ask South Africans to um, apply for a visa, but it does for the United States. Okay. And I used to go there for work. Uh, and that so I'd be standing outside, you know, the, the customs hall waiting for my U.S. colleagues to to come through an hour and a half Coming later. Off. You know, that's <laughs> a, that, that's a minor benefit. But, um, you know, it, the world's a big place and there are different mm -hmm. groups of countries um, having a, a passport from a member of the a Commonwealth of Nations, the old British Commonwealth, uh, also opens doors because it means you have sometimes uh, preferential rights to, uh, you know, to extended stays study, uh, you get longer work permits and things like that. So there are all kinds of things that come kind of from having a second passport. Right. And so what are the, some of the common mistakes people might take when looking for a second citizenship? Well, I think that the key one is always that you don't think through the lifestyle aspect. Um, because like I said, the goal is ultimately uh, that if you need to, you're going to go and live in this place. Um, so, you know, if you, if you, if you, for example, the Caribbean islands are classic case in point, you can get passports there much easier than in many places. But ultimately, people find out that that's island life is not, not that easy, you know, um, and, and not thinking through what it's going to be like to be there on a long term basis is probably the number one. Um, the, the, the second mistake people often make, and, and again, it's often associated with the Caribbean, but also in um, places like Portugal, uh, is that 
you get a, a citizenship or a residence as part of a property development scheme. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, 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 the document is linked to buying property in a particular uh, scheme. So very common in the Caribbean. And problem is that, you know, you may really want the passport, but you may not want to be, live in that place. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes you get locked into things that you don't really want, um, you know, because that's the route to the passport. Um, but it's, it seems like it's easier, but in the long term, it can actually cause you a lot of problems because then you may have limitations on when you're allowed to sell that property. Uh, you may end up having to pay huge taxes on, on the property to get out of it in order to move somewhere else. Uh, so be very careful of that. Um, and then the last one, as I was saying, it really goes back to lifestyle. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the critical thing that people um, do is, is they focus on the mechanics of the process rather than the, the outcome. Um, and that leads them to overpay for advice. I think that's what the third big mistake is. There are lots of websites out there that are promising to help people get second passports. Mm -hmm. Some of those uh, companies are actually embedded with the governments that they work with. In other words, they are appointed as advisors. And in some cases, you're forced to go through them. But in other cases, they're asking you to pay for things that you can actually do yourself. Uh, and so part of what I uh, am hoping to do here at IL is to help people um, you know, go through this process if they make, decide to get a second passport without getting sucked into paying somebody for something that you don't really need to pay for. But they um, right. Now, there's always going to be costs involved, there's time involved, and knowing how to do it is, is very helpful. But you don't always have to pay the enormous fees that these people ask uh, you know, for something that is in the public domain. I got stung with that a couple of years ago. I was getting um, an American visa just to travel in, and I thought I was on the the, the national website. And I wasn't, and I got charged like I think like two hundred dollars, which oh would have cost like I think it was like thirty at the time. So it was probably designed to look like a state department. It was, department. looked the exact same. It looked the exact <laughs> same. Yeah, and I work for International Living. I should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time, ask me. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, you weren't here at the time. Yeah, and so you mentioned those Caribbean island nations, and um, so yes. those passports are relatively fast and cheap. And um, so why don't more Americans take advantage of them? Well, I think in, in the States, there's a, there's a perception that they're kind of seedy, you know, that, that they are maybe favored by uh, people who have got something to hide, which is not fair in many cases. I mean, th these are lovely countries. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the Caribbean and, you know, they really are, um, most of the countries are, are very much uh, above board. And, and if, if that's the lifestyle you like, it's, it's great. But I think that the general perception is that it's, you know, where ne'er-do-wells go. Um, and uh, the, the, in the press in the States and in Canada, there's often a lot of discussion of uh, the fact that the biggest uptake is, again, from, from Chinese. And so they worry, you know, am I going to get associated with that? You know, is it, um, you know, if, if the, the U.S. or Canada decides to crack down on these passports uh, because of their association with, with something um, that's not 100% above board, am I going to get caught up in that? Um, in fact, a while back, there were a couple of countries that did get into trouble with Canada in particular, where the Canadians said, well, we're now going to impose visas on people from these countries because we think that a lot of uh, people have been getting those passports for nefarious reasons. So there's, there's that. Um, it's not yeah. 100% deserved, uh, but, but it's out there. Um, and then the second one, of course, is that linkage between the citizenship option and the property developments. That's very okay. common on the islands. Um, it's not, you don't always have to do it, but uh, it's particularly common in, in places like Anguilla and um, Antigua and, and places like that. Um, and, you know, people just, they don't want to get roped into that. And when they start doing the homework, they realize, eh, you know, I, yeah, I, I would like to have a passport from that place, but I really don't want to have to spend a lot of money uh, buying a property that I don't mm -hmm. want. So that's the second thing. And then the third one, I think, is that island life just isn't for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a particular kind of person to live on a, on a small island. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a small community that's usually very closely knit and insular, and it takes a long time to make friends and all that. Um, some people love that. They, they just want to be on their own on the beach under a palm tree and not be bothered. That's fine. 
Um, but from a, a lifestyle perspective, the islands are not for everyone. And mm -hmm. Americans like to wander around. I think that's that's one thing. So they yeah. tend to go to to countries that have uh, you know that are bigger. <laughs> Put it that way. More explore, right? More right. explore. Having said that, I mean, I mean, there are certain people who love it. I mean, if if you're into yachting, uh, you know, if you're into anything having to do with uh, you know water sports in the ocean, it's a great place. And and again, I love the Caribbean. I'm not knocking it as an option. I'm just saying that, that, that as you asked, um, there are certain perceptions in the states about them, um, and so you just have to be selective. I mean, I would certainly recommend some of the, the passport uh, schemes, uh, but you just need to, to know exactly what you're getting into and why. Yeah, again, based on someone's personal criteria, what they're looking for, maybe it suits, yes. well, it suits some people. And so um, just a question for you. Remember all of those $1 homes were um, in Italy? Were they offering citizenship um, if you had to? I know they were all different schemes of some in Sicily. There was, but were they offering citizenship at the time if you spent a certain amount on renovating? Or, But I feel like there, there, was, there was a lot of complications with those. Well, I think, I mean, the Italian scheme, because I remember seeing, you know, uh, articles about these lovely mountain towns where you could buy a, a dollar house and all that. Yeah. Um, I think there were, there were two things about it. One was that they were trying to get people to repopulate and rejuvenate um, and stimulate the economies of areas that were, that were fading. Um, and the second thing was that the property markets were in dire straits after mm -hmm. the, uh, the global financial crisis. I think the Italian scheme gave you permanent residence, but not citizenship. But permanent residence or a long-term visa does lead to citizenship if you know if you acquire mm -hmm. a certain you know if you naturalize yourself. So people who who bought those houses, who learned to speak Italian, who you know got embedded into the country and, and spent the money, yes, then then citizenship becomes an option. Um, but in general, I think, um, you know, we talk about golden visas a lot at, at IL and there's been a real uproar, quite frankly, in the golden visa sector recently. And the reason for that is because what made sense 10 years ago uh, to uh, many European countries like Ireland, for example, uh, doesn't make sense now. Uh, and that's because the property markets in those countries have started to pick back up again and having foreigners compete with locals for property is now pushing up property prices to the extent that locals can't afford. Uh, and so when we see in the headlines, um, I, I don't, I don't think that was a big issue in Ireland, but mm -hmm. in Portugal it was um, basically the Portuguese property market, the average price went up or <clears throat> by about 65% uh, from 2012 until now. Uh, and that's just priced Portuguese out of the market entirely. And yeah. so the government, basically canceled that part of the program. They haven't canceled the whole thing. You can still go there um, based on your income and all that, uh, but you have to live there. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with the golden visa thing was you, you didn't have to live there. You could just buy the property, spend a week or two, leave. The property goes off the market um, and all the sellers are thinking, well, I want to sell to somebody from overseas, so I'm going to put a 500,000 euro price tag on my house. Oops. Whereas before it might have been 150. Right. And right. that just didn't make sense. So uh, I'm not quite sure what's happened to that Italian program, but I think in general, that whole uh, purchasing property to get in, that's kind of gone now. Uh, and, and there are a few places left. But generally speaking, I think the main route is if you want to go and live someplace, uh, there are many options still in the EU where you can get long term residence based on uh, the fact that you have offshore income. Uh, you mm -hmm. might rent or, or buy, but that's not the main reason. But you've got to live there. That's the right. critical thing. You're not yeah. taking property off the market. You are becoming part of the market. And you're contributing to the economy. You're spending money there and all that. So that's where the thing is headed. And I think most IL uh, listeners are probably, that's really probably going to be their main goal, um, is they want to live someplace. Yeah. Uh, so I think the golden visa, um, you know, the Italian renovation approach may still persist. Still available in Greece, still available in Spain, although it seems to be changing. Mm -hmm. um, but the key thing is, if you want to live overseas and you've got the resources to do it uh, in the EU, it's still possible. And so, just for just so I'm correct, so yes. you can so the golden visa is in terms of like now buying a residential property to get a visa that's gone away, but you can still invest a substantial amount in a government scheme or say, is it yes. that still true? Yeah. 
Well, okay. let's see. I mean, there, there, there are some countries that do it. Portugal has said that they are going to be um, keeping their investment in, in uh, uh, government schemes alive. In other words, that's still a pathway. You can still invest in a business as long as you intend to be in Portugal and run it okay. and hire people. That's fine. Uh, but they want you in the country. They want you contributing actively to the economy and to the society. All that stuff is fine, but just buying a property and going away is not going to work. Ireland, on the other hand, from what I understand, has decided that um, they're going to close down your, um, I forget what the name of the program is, basically it's investment in, through approved mm -hmm. funds. What they're allowing people to do is until those funds are fully subscribed, in other words, until they've met their investment targets, they're still open. Uh, and I'm not sure where things stand now. Today is the 7th. I predicted that by about this time, uh, depending on, on how things go, they could be getting close to full. But there's still a small window of opportunity there. Um, but generally speaking, the programs were designed for an economic crisis and a financial crisis. And that crisis has now faded. We have another crisis. Now it's inflation. Inflation, so right. You don't want people pushing up prices the way that they did in the earlier time. So um, the roots are smaller there's fewer of them but they're more suited i think for the kind mm. of people who, who um, sign up for il because they're about real people not just yeah. investors yeah that's a good point and so yeah. i'm sure we could do a whole other episodes on passports from ancestry mm -hmm. but that's obviously still possible in a lot of countries that we rec recommend here at il especially a lot of european countries but give us a lay the lay of the land on that a little bit what's still possible well, uh, many countries in, in Europe have got uh, ancestry-based passports, and, and they're all different. Um, you know, some of them go quite far back. I think Ireland goes fairly far back. Um, Italy goes fairly far back. Um, some of them you have to have, um, you, your ancestors have to have maintained their citizenship up until a certain point. And, you know, um, and generally speaking, those programs are, are more complex to navigate than strictly, you know, investment-based programs or um, you know, residence-based programs where you're living in the, uh, you know, say on retirement income. That, that's a lot easier. The ancestry stuff, you, I mean, you've got to do some serious archival research. I think for a lot of places, um, some of the more popular programs are clearly Italy is one of the most popular. Ireland is one. Uh, the UK still actually has one, um, and it's you know, as long as you can demonstrate the the ancestry. Um, Spain uh, has mm -hmm. one. In fact, it's more preferable to people from Latin America uh, than from any other part of the world, including Puerto Rico, which is interesting. Right. Uh, if you mm -hmm. live in Puerto Rico, you're considered part of Latin America for the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means anybody, a U.S. citizen, can go live there for two years and then become considered Latin American for the perspective of that visa. Ah, just as a side. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, but other countries have also got them. Germany does, uh, Hungary does. Uh, and then there are permutations of them that relate to World War II, uh, to the Holocaust, to um, the population resettlement and migration after the war. Uh, if you can prove that your ancestors were affected by it, sometimes that's a very quick route to a passport. Um, but generally, the, uh, the decision to try to get one that way uh, does require a lot of support. Um, mm. and particularly in terms of documentation. So that's a, a good reason to want to retain somebody who's an expert in that, uh, yeah. in, the, in the target country, because they'll know where the archives are. They'll know where to find the documents that you need, the marriage registers, the birth registers, and things like that. But yes, it remains an attractive option. Uh, there are some estimates that say that 40% of the U.S. population is potentially eligible for um, uh, passports by ancestry. And, and that includes relatively recent groups of migrants, for example. Um, something I learned recently is that um, the second and third generation of Indian immigrants to the States, because there's a very big Indian community here, are eligible to acquire Indian passports uh, you know, uh, through ancestry. So look, we shouldn't forget about that. You know? Yeah. Um, but as a general rule, I think um, it, it's all about being able to prove the connection. Um, and that's very different from me from being able to prove that you got X amount of money in your bank account. You yeah. can print out your bank statement and send Show it to it. them, but you can't really do that with, <laughs> with marriage yeah. and birth certificates. So, so yeah, I think that's where it's good to have help. And that's something that, that we hope to uh, help people with as well. 
Yeah, great. It sounds like it'd be, it's obviously a big deep dive because there's a lot of like, you know, old files and st- et cetera that you have to dig up. But what a, what an interesting kind of way to explore your 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 background. I mean, that's... Yeah, well, that's I actually of- had a guy write into me the other day uh, who had just acquired an Irish passport citizenship uh, through, because his grandfather had you know, was Irish. And uh, he was asking me questions about, you know, he literally had no idea what he had just got. Uh, he didn't. He didn't realize that he was eligible to live anywhere in the EU. Um, he, he didn't know about uh, the EU health insurance scheme. And when I, you know, I wrote to him, I said, "Hey, you, you just scored. You won the lotto." Uh, he, <laughs> yeah, he, he was thrilled. He was thrilled. So, so I think you know that's a. It is if, if it's an option, that's a good option to explore. Just be aware that it's going to take a little bit more time and effort than that. Right, that's great. And so, Ted, you have a second citizenship, and how has that changed your life? Ooh, having the option, always knowing in the back of my mind that um, I have a second home uh, and that, you know, I, I uh, and also just knowing that having taken that first step, that if I wanted to, I could take others um, because I know it's possible. And I think that's that's the thing is it it it, it you, you realize that you really can be a citizen of the world. I know it's kind of a cliche, but. Um, the world is a big place. And um, once you become part of more than one part of it, you realize that, uh, you know, it, you don't have to think of yourself as being stuck where you are or stuck in the circumstances that you are. Um, I've mentioned some practical benefits um, and, you know, in terms of travel and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it just the fact that um, I am considered South African, um, when I'm there and then I'm accepted and, you know, uh, that I, I feel at home, I can't tell you. Because, like I said, I'm in the middle of moving back to Cape Town um, and looking forward to it. You know, it's yeah. the fact that I can do that is, is just great. Yeah, 100%. Ted, that was great. Really, really great insights there. Um, so if anyone wants to find more on Ted's writings, they can check out the International Living website. And mm-hmm. also they can sign up for our postcards. I'm very excited to do some more episodes with you, Ted. I think there's lots of great insights you can give to people on mm-hmm. this whole world of global diversification. I'm sure there's lots more. So anyone have any ideas that you'd like Ted to cover, do leave them in the comments below. Um, Ted, that was great. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you very soon. And good luck with the move. Great. No problem. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I'm yeah. going to be launching some uh, new uh, ideas and some new uh, ways of communicating. I think we're going to try to set up a blog and then um, I'm probably going to be doing, uh, you know, some reports and things. So keep keep an eye out for those two. Absolutely. Yeah, you'll discover all that on postcards. So definitely sign up for that so you can hear all about Ted's new services. So yeah, thanks, Ted. And uh, Good pleasure. we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks, Lynn. Take care. Bye-bye. And there you have it, another episode of ILTV. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Be sure to hit the subscribe button below, turn on your notifications so you don't miss out on any future videos, and join me for next week's episode.